just to get us started, I should explain what the purpose of this uh, Zoom recording webinar is. Um, at the Oral History Center, we do hundreds of hours of interviews every year. And uh, when COVID-19 hit and we were shut down, uh, we couldn't do our work because our work is in-person interviewing with video cameras. Uh, and we cast about for solutions. Um, and Zoom appeared immediately for almost everyone who was able to do remote work as a solution um, for them. And uh, we understood that there's a recording function on Zoom. And we wondered if we would be able to use this. So, so that has, that's sort of the story of, of what we're doing. And that helps contextualize w what this is. Um, I understand that there's a problem with access in our world um, and it's affecting uh, a lot of folks who do not have easy access to the internet and in particular broadband internet. Uh, the digital divide has been a phrase that has been bandied about for since the since the 90s uh, since we've we've had the internet uh, there have been uh, claims about this and I think there's been a lot of uh, people have become complacent uh, because they assumed, well, surely by now everyone has access to the internet. And sure enough, if you ask the question, is there access to the internet? Uh, there is fairly broad access, but when you drill down and look at what that access means, uh, it can look a little bit different. Uh, so right now in the, in the public education world, people are thinking about how people have access to the internet or don't have access to the internet, meaningful access. And uh, Zoom is pretty high bandwidth. And so uh, that means that uh, access looks a little bit different when you're talking about something like Zoom. So in this slide that I'm sharing, you can see that uh, large proportions of, of some populations have access and others uh, don't all have access. Um, when you look at internet access uh, just through a smartphone, which isn't quite the same, um, you'd start taking more chunks out of that out of those uh, groups. And so some groups are don't have as much access as others. In oral history, we do a lot of interviewing with older folks because we are looking at people's life life histories and people are often interviewed in the over 65 group often in the over 80 group uh, so when we ask the question about usage of internet it starts to look different as well so in the over 65 group uh, a recent uh, survey concluded that 74 percent of people in the over 65 group have access to the internet there's no data on people over 80, uh, which is my primary constituency uh, when I'm talking about the interviews that I do. Uh, and if you're asking a question about broadband access in the over 65 group, it drops to 59%, which um, is a dramatic increase in the last few years. So there has been a lot of that gap has been closed in that age group uh, just in the last three years. And I think it's probably gone up a little bit in the age of COVID-19. When you layer that on top of other categories, people under resourced groups, um, and you add to that older category, it drops even more. And so access is an issue. It's something that we're concerned about. It's an issue of equity and justice. Um, what we're doing here is assuming the use of Zoom. And that's a big assumption, but we're assuming the use of Zoom. And uh, we had to think about what the average narrator that we might be able to interview remotely would have access to on hand. And so uh, there are lots, there are some fancy options for getting high quality audio and video out there. They're worth exploring and talking about but 
when we were discussing how we were going to do this, we came up against the same problem over and over again, is how do you, how do you manage on the hardware side and the, the software, or the, uh, the internet connection side, quality on the narrator side, which is the important side. And so we came up with some workarounds uh, with Zoom, and that's what we're going to explore uh, in this webinar today. Now, this doesn't mean we, we're going to reach everyone, but we're going to reach a lot of people with this, and it's going to enable us to continue our work. And in fact, I have resumed my work. I have a full roster of interviews on Zoom, and, uh, and it's going well. So uh, let's, let's talk about what all of this means. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, the kind of basic needs for doing successful Zoom recording on the internet on the, on the narrator side. I'm assuming that you're probably going to be okay on your side, although we should talk about that. Uh, settings are very important in Zoom, um, especially when you're setting up a meeting. Um, when you s schedule a meeting, it, uh, it sets the settings that you had when you set up the meeting. So you can't go back unless you redo the meeting. So uh, there, are, there are mistakes that were made uh, as we were fumbling around trying to get this right. Uh, and we continue to make, <laughs> it's tricky. Uh, and the settings change. Uh, so Zoom is evolving quickly, and we'll need to talk about that a little bit. How do you prepare for remote interviews? How do you prepare the narrator for remote interviews? That's something that we need to talk about. It overlaps well with in-person interviewing, but you have to do it, have to help the, you have to help the narrator to help you to get them in the best light and with the best sound quality. Um, and normally you just take care of all of that when you're interviewing in person and they don't have to think about anything, but you're asking for their help. And so that's an important thing to consider. Security is an issue. Uh, it's always an issue with oral history. Um, you're dealing with someone's life story. You're dealing with personal details and you want to make sure you have, you communicate with them uh, your data management plan and uh, offer some assurances about Zoom. And there's been a lot of press about Zoom security and Zoom bombing and people coming into meeting rooms. Uh, we're vulnerable to this right now because I've decided not to lock the meeting room and the password was available on several sites as people were hearing about this. But we wanted to maximize access and we'll see what happens. But, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, we'll talk about how to guarantee security of your meeting room while you're doing your recording. Um, and uh, I'll say a little bit about narrators joining by phone, especially by telephone. Uh, but Zoom is really steering people away from that. Uh, I don't know exactly why. I suspect it's, it's a difficult for them to manage. Um, and uh, not every institutional vendor or institutional provider includes that as part of their plans. Uh, they just assume people are not going to be doing that. So that's another access issue that's worth talking about. But there are instructions on Zoom for, for joining by phone. This uh, piece of um, a backup audio um, has to do with what we were trying to do in terms of a workaround. And uh, what we've settled on is, is asking the narrators, we, we assume um, fairly wide usage of, of smartphones at this point. Again, not everyone has them uh, or uses them. So um, we ask people to download an, an audio recording app that records in high quality audio and to use that as a backup recording and also as a recording that could later potentially be synced with the Zoom recording to give a higher quality of audio. So I'll explain more about Zoom audio quality and the problems with it, as well as um, what 
possible solution there is with an alternate audio source. Alrighty. So uh, internet speed uh, is an issue. Um, the official claim of Zoom is that you only need a few megabits per second uh, download and upload speed to have a Zoom meeting. That might be true. Um, one of the problems is that uh, uh, bandwidth is funny, and especially it's funny with um, with cable. So um, what happens is that if you're on a cable setup with your um, with your internet service provider. It's a trunk line that is shared among a number of different users. And depending on the usage and the time of day and um, what people are doing with their devices, um, the bandwidth can be sucked down quite low, even if you technically have a high um, rated bandwidth um, for, for your internet connection. Um, if just sorry for the technical language bandwidth if if you don't know is is kind of the the flow the rate of flow of data across the internet uh, from your connection at home to the wider internet and there's a download speed like what the flow is to your machine uh, and to your 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 port and the upload speed. And the upload speed is always smaller than the download speed. It's often an eighth or a tenth of the download speed. And I think that's where things get into problems. Uh, so you want to check your internet speed test, uh, do an internet speed test, and you just put in internet speed test in Google, and up comes a free, uh, Google has one, and there are many other free ones, and you just click on it. And it does a stress test of your internet connection, and it tells you what you actually are downloading at and what you're uploading at at that moment and that will change radically throughout the day from moment to moment even so that's instructive and so what that tells you is that you want to err on the side of maximizing your bandwidth with by whatever means possible and on the narrator side it tells you what you have to work with right so if you if it's very low on the on the narrator side there's an issue uh, solutions might include um, shutting off your video and uh, so that you're only um, the the narrator's video is is on all the time uh, and yours isn't and that might conserve bandwidth uh, another solution might be trying to find an alternate location if there's some kind of institutional affiliation that they have or they had let's say they're retired uh, a professor at a university for example um, and they might be able to go in uh, and uh, use a more stable internet connection somewhere else or a community center or a church. Uh, there are possibilities, but you want to, again, you want to enlist the help of the narrator in, in helping you to figure out what to do uh, with the issue of speed. So a basic minimum I would say would be 75 megabits per second download and an eight megabytes per second upload. I would go higher. I would go the highest you can. Um, and you might say, well, that's gonna, I don't, ha I can't afford that. It's too expensive. Um, internet service providers are banking on using the latest up to date plans. Um, and funnily enough, um, my wife and I both use Zoom at the same time, all the time, when during the workday. And we encountered so much grief at the beginning. Our modem was seven years old, and we had a uh, long ago timed out of our contract with, with uh, our internet service provider. And we were just going month to month, and we figured, well, that's got to be the, le the least costly option. So we decided we had to bite the bullet and upgrade and and increase our our internet speed by a factor of ten to really get around this problem. And uh, our we signed up for another two year contract. We got a brand new modem, and that's key. It's important to update your modems. 
uh, within two or three years, they get out of date and uh, they, they, there are new protocols that come online and uh, they just become unwieldy and less reliable and less powerful. Uh, so make sure your modems are up to date. So with this new plan uh, and a brand new modem, our internet bill went down by $20 a month. So it's not necessarily more costly to keep an up upgraded internet connection. So that's something to consider, um, at least on your end. Uh, and it, it, it might be worth suggesting on the narrator's end if they care about those things. One of the things that I suspect is driving the broadband access um, increase among the over 65 set is the really strong desire to see one's grandkids who are, or great grandkids who are far away. Uh, and I, I'm half joking, but I think it's, it's, it's actually a factor. Uh, I think there's a, a, a real strong desire to, to a human desire to do that. And broadband allows you to do that in a very genuine way. Um, and so that might be driving access. So you may have fewer problems uh, than you think, um, but increasing the internet speed is something that should be considered on both ends. As I mentioned, cable is uh, goes up and down. And so that's an issue in terms of getting reliable uh, connection and not having the internet freeze on you when you're doing an interview. That's really important. And a fiber, uh, fiber optic connection is 100% um, what you see, what, what you pay for is what you get. So if you sign up for 25 megabit per second upload and download with fiber, that you own that bandwidth and it comes directly to your uh, home. So that's probably the most reliable, but again, access is an issue and fiber optics are just being rolled out in areas right now and they won't be rolled out in, in a lot of areas, including rural areas for a very long time. So that's something to consider. So, so try and get as much bandwidth as you can. Um, and another thing to think about as well is uh, to uh, make sure that you don't have a lot of apps running in the background. Um, you might want to keep a single browser window open if you need to check things, um, but otherwise, uh, things like Microsoft Word, and you would think that that would be the lowest, least costly bandwidth sucker, uh, and bandwidth sucker, I mean processing speed sucker on your, on your uh, computer, are actually can be terrible uh, if you leave them open. Um, they can, especially on Macs, Microsoft Word can go haywire and it can take up all of your processing power basically and freeze your computer. Uh, so close apps that you're not using uh, and that will make sure that your computer is stable. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of processing power to run Zoom efficiently and uh, your computer can get stressed fairly easily. And I already mentioned that one solution is to turn off the uh, is turn off the video. A last resort would be to turn off the video for the narrator, but then I mean, then you're just doing audio only, and there might be easier ways to do that. Um, so those are some of the things to think about with respect to the internet and your computer setup. Um, not everyone has a laptop. I think. Uh, laptops and, and tablets especially are very popular. Um, they're widely used and smartphones are widely used. Um, but I would suggest use one of these devices and not a desktop unless the desktop is very well set up for audio and video. You sometimes encounter um, setups where people have a desktop but it has no sound card. It's just uh, it has no microphone, it has no camera, or it has an outboard camera that's stuck on the top of the, of the computer screen. Uh, laptops and uh, tablets have built-in features that enable you to do this kind of work. Um, I think it's becoming more of a feature across the, the panoply of of devices because of the ubiquity of video conferencing and this kind of thing. 
uh, but just check and make sure that there's adequate setup on the other side. Uh, top mount cameras can be fisheye, which is uh, because they're far away and they capture the whole room and they also distort the room and you want to avoid that situation if you can, but you deal with what you can, what you get. Uh, laptops have an advantage as well, and I'll talk about this with respect to audio recording, is that they act as a reflecting surface. And so when you're capturing your audio um, using a different device, that can be an advantage. So let's march into the larger question of settings. Someone asked if is 75 megabits per second really required? I'm viewing at 20 megabits with high quality and no glitches. Well, good. <laughs> that sounds that sounds excellent. So as I said, Zoom claims that it's something like eight download, eight megabits per second download, and three upload is the minimum. I had 75 before, and it wasn't enough. So what would happen is it was 75 and eight. That's what I had. But as I said, with a cable connection, it can really ramp down moment to moment. We're not talking about over time. They're going to give you, they're going to give you an average bandwidth over a 24 hour period or whatever. Um, in a moment, it, I, I was getting, I was testing the speed and my upload speed was down to 1.5, right? And the upload speed is, is important. <laughs> So if you have, a, you know, the, the, having this, it's, it's biased towards download speed from an era when we were kind of just downloading, there wasn't a lot of uploading going on unless you were pirating MP3s or something like that. Um, and so, uh, so the upload speed is, is not well looked after and you can get into real trouble um, on that end. If you have no trouble with it and, um, you're not running multiple devices. So in a household, if you've got kids, you know, and there's, you, you know, your, your, your TV is connected to the internet, your coffee maker is connected to the internet, you've got 15 devices running off of it, um, it can add up and you can have issues. So that's another thing I should mention too. If you have, if you're doing an interview and you're recording at that time, make sure that you have your other devices off um, oh, confirm that the internet test speed. So the, the internet speed test is uh, on either side, you have to do it. It only tests the speed at that point, at, the, at that uh, address. And so uh, you're going to ask the narrator to test that speed. And then you'll just know, you may not be able to do anything about it but you'll know what the problem is or could be if you try to record. Okay, and a 40 minute time limit, if it's only on one, on, if it's only one on one. Uh, so um, we'll talk about this. This has to do with free versus licensed. Um, if you have a free account, um, I had meant, I have a poll here. I was gonna ask folks if, if people have a free account or if they have a licensed account, if they either pay for one or if they have a, uh, if they are affiliated with an institution that gives them access to a license. Okay, I have just sent a poll. <laughs> so about a little over a third of you have a free account. So that's good because um, I have something to say for both groups. It's good to know that what the different, um, uh, situations are with folks and we'll talk about using Zoom with a free account and you can use Zoom for account and you can record. The 40 minute limit, um, I looked it up on Zoom and they said the 40 limit apl applies to three or more people using Zoom. So if you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, you're actually possibly exempt from that. However, there's what's on Zoom at a given moment and there's what actually happens. And those are two different things. And I don't fault Zoom for that because things are changing so quickly. They change what's available quickly, usually for the better. Um, they're adapting to a rapidly changing environment. And that's something to keep in mind throughout all of this. 
that's probably why we're going to have to do another one of these in a couple of months because everything's changed. I something an important thing changed with Zoom this week. So just to give you an idea. Um, so there is a workaround if you find that there's a 40 minute limit and you have a free account. At the end of the 40 minutes, you leave the meeting. It's the same meeting ID and you ask the narrator to rejoin the meeting and you rejoin the meeting and the clock starts again. Now, if you're recording, that's, that sets up a separate, um, you have to get your, make sure you get your recording first from that it clears it out and it will, you're going to record locally and we'll talk about that. So, um, so there's a workaround and you can just, put in 40 minute zoom workaround and <laughs> it won't come up. There'll be different options for that. So, uh, so don't lose heart. Um, you can do that. And you might think, well, that's a pain to have to interrupt an interview at the 40 minute mark. Uh, until seven years ago at the oral history center, backed by the university of California, Berkeley, we were recording on HD video tape that was 60 minutes long and we really needed to round things off at around 50 minutes. Um, and so that was, uh, that was something we had to deal with and we had to switch out the videotape and, um, and that's just part of, that was part of the work and we incorporated it into our work and it worked fine. So that's just something you would need to deal with, uh, with a free account. Um, So returning back to uh, the issue of um, audio and video settings, a free account with respect to settings, you don't get a lot of choices and uh, you, have to, um, you have to record locally. And that means that that defeats a lot of the bonuses and options that you have with a licensed recording, but they're not decisive. Um, so uh, as I said, there's this 40 minute limit or they may not be anymore. Check, just have to check on that. Um, and there, but there's a workaround to that. With a paid subscription uh, or a license with an affiliated institution, you uh, can record to the cloud now, what that does is that when you finish your recording, you stop your recording and you leave the Zoom meeting that begins the processing part of the uh, interview. And it gives you a, 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 a video that's optimized for using with a video editor. So it sends you an MP4. It's not clear to me how much better quality you can get um, a good quality recording with your basic free account as well, but it's recorded locally. Now, what this means is that you get with the cloud recording, you can get a transcript. So it will automatically generate a transcript. So the, um, the paid version will generate a transcript. So when you close your, your, when you stop your recording and you end your meeting, it begins the process of the processing and it generates an audio uh, file if you set it to do so, which is useful for further external transcription or uh, it gives you a nice MP4, uh, MP, M4A, which is slightly better MP3 quality audio. And it gives you a, a video and it gives you a transcript. Now the transcripts are a mixed blessing. The transcription is good but it is time code happy. It puts in time codes every few words and it, it requires a lot of cleaning up that is labor intensive. I haven't quite figured out a way to make it easy. So it might be easier to take your um, small audio file and uh, upload that to um, a machine transcription service where you can control a lot of variables like time codes. That's, that's another subject for another Zoom conversation. Um, but that might be an easier way to get a better, cleaner transcript. Um, so Descript and companies like that are, uh, um, 
are, are useful for that and they're relatively inexpensive. So um, with a paid license, you get higher quality, which means it's optimized for further video editing. Um, but there's a bit of a trick there. Um, you have to go in and disable some settings that might be default. So this is the disadvantage with, um, with a license is you need to go into your settings and clean them up a little bit so that they're really truly optimized for Zoom recording. Free account, you don't have to worry because they kind of set it for you and there's nothing you can do. Um, so we had some trouble when we were doing, um, so this is a screenshot of me in my settings uh, with my paid account. You can see that you've got a whole raft of options under recording. So you go into settings here when you first sign into your uh, Zoom account and uh, you can, there are settings for meeting, recording, and telephone. We're not going to really talk about telephone. Uh, but in, under the recording section, it's important to specify record active speaker with shared screen. Um, and so this actually def make, uh, makes sure that when the person is talking, they're featured in the recording. And when you're not talking as the, net, as the interviewer, you want to mute yourself, right? It's a good practice to sort of make sure that you're not introducing any noise. If you like, if your pencil drops on your table, it's going to introduce noise in the system and it will trigger the video to come to you and you're sitting there like whatever. Uh, and that's going to be on the recording. So you don't want that or, you know, you might sneeze or sniffle or something like that. So mute yourself when you're not asking a question and allow the narrator to tell their story and they will be featured full screen. So it's actually a nice two shot camera setup. Um, and when you're ready to ask your question, you ask your question and the screen shifts to you and it records you asking the question. So it's quite nice. When we started doing this, we had trouble because we, we got the recording and we're like, this wasn't what we wanted. And it was recording in gallery view and gallery view with two people has you side by side. So there's a narrator and the interviewer and you're just talking and, and when you're answering, you're like nodding your head and, and, and so forth, which is great, except that, well, you may not want that. <laughs> and that's certainly not what we would do when we're, in, when we're setting up our in-person interviews. We wanna, we wanna shoot the narrator not the interviewer. Um, so um, recording active speaker is what you want when you're doing um, when you're doing your settings for the licensed version and not gallery view. Um, you want to select record an audio only file and that will be generated and it's useful to have with it. You don't have to do any extra work. It just generates a nice small compressed audio file that is is useful for machine transcription and other things. Um, one thing that gave us trouble, these things were default for some reason. So we did our we did our first Zoom recording and it had this big fat Roger Early prior like across the screen and the time code with it like churning on and uh, it was really bizarre and we just wondered why that would be the default. So we had to go into our settings and change that. And remember when you're setting your settings, the settings you set when you're scheduling your meeting, when you're setting up a new meeting, those will be the settings for the recording, right? There are some settings that you can change on the fly and those will mostly be in your in your Zoom app when it's open. Those are the things you can change. It's you can't change things once you've set it up that way, which is a problem, um, but there we go. And then further down here, um, optimize the recording for third-party video editor and generate an audio transcript with the aforementioned problems. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, just this week, um, in under in meeting advance let me go back here uh i'll probably show you i'll do a little show and tell in my settings and i'll show you just kind of the layout of it and 
recording settings, there are not too many. When you go up here and you click on uh, settings and you click on meeting here, that's the settings for the meeting itself. And there's a huge number of settings for that. So um, down at the bottom of those settings, if you have a Zoom license, you go to meeting and you scroll down or you can just click on in meeting advanced. You can select group HD video and uh, early experiments this week uh, lead me to conclude tentatively and provisionally that this may result in a higher definition recording. We'll see if the, you know, it actually results in a higher uh, file size. Um, now, this goes back to the issue of bandwidth. You want to have generous bandwidth and a really stable internet connection to make use of this. If it works out, it could be really nice. You could get pretty good quality video with um, a, a pretty accessible app. Is this available with the free version? I didn't see it, um, but uh, you, I think in your settings, in your window, you might wanna root around a bit. I think there, there was an HD button uh, in meeting. Um, if you, for those of you with a free license, you might want to root around and see if you can find that under uh, participants, I think. So that's a piece of good news, but also uh, th th that other teachable moment, things are changing very fast and uh, I'm struggling to keep up. <laughs> um, now, uh, settings for users with a free Zoom account. This is, this is what you have. Um, so not a lot of choices. You have to record locally. Uh, you don't get a choice to record in the cloud. So it doesn't give you a transcript, but it does give you recording. And it, the differences were not in file size were no, there was no difference. Um, so, you, you know, for, I did one meeting, it was an hour and a half and it generated a 400 megabyte file. So not huge, it's not great high res, but it was uh, serviceable. Um, so uh, you get a sense that there's fewer choices with the free account and that's very, very true. Um, so when you're scheduling a meeting uh, and this has to do with security. Everyone who has a Zoom account, whether it's free or licensed, is assigned a personal meeting ID or a PMI. And um, those with a free account have to use their PM ID. So um, what that means, it's a dedicated Zoom room for you. It never changes. The number, the meeting number never changes. And uh, password, if you set a password, never changes unless you change it. Um, and so that could be tricky if you're setting up a bunch of different meetings with people. Uh, you're giving out your personal meeting ID. And, and, and so that means forever after, if someone wants to hop in on your Zoom, when you're interviewing somebody else, for example, they can do so. Or if you use that meeting ID to run your regular meetings. Let's say you have use it a lot for work and you're having regular meetings and maybe you've scheduled a meeting right before an interview and the narrator hops on before because that's kind of normal human behavior. We like to be early. Uh, so they're gonna hop right into your planning meeting for your work. Right? So, uh, so it's not super ideal. So what you may wanna do it, you don't, it's the only option for free. So there's not a lot of choice there. If you have a licensed account, you probably want to set up a, a unique password and meeting ID for each meeting that you have with the narrator, with anyone external and keep your personal meeting ID for all the meetings that you have with your colleagues at work, right? You can just keep using that PM ID. It's easy. Uh, you can just set up a meeting on the fly and say, hey, join me in my, in my personal meeting room. So to do that, you have to go into your settings as a licensed user and defeat the use personal meeting ID when scheduling a meeting. And then it automatically generates a new personal meeting, a new meeting ID, not personal, 
with a new password that's unique to that meeting. So that's handy for doing interviews with folks uh, outside of your organization. Uh, so when you're, um, when, how do you schedule a meeting? Um, you sign in to your Zoom uh, web um, account. And I use that. There is, you can open the Zoom app and you can schedule meetings in app. I find the interface less complete. I, I like using the web, but you might have a different preference or you might be much more adept at using these kinds of things than I am. Uh, so, you know, do what you're comfortable with. You can, you, there's an extension for Google. You can schedule a meeting right from the extension. You just click on it and you schedule a meeting. That's fine. We're doing this full, the, you know, getting behind the scenes and looking at the full interface. And, and that's going to help us sort of figure out what's going on with Zoom. So go into the, when you sign, sign into Zoom and, and into the full web interface. Um, and go to meetings uh, and click on schedule a new meeting. And then you, you, you just schedule it on your, you, uh, schedule the time and the date. And then you click save and it has calendar options. So if you have a Gmail account, it's got Google Calendar. If you've got Out Outlook and I think some, I think there's Yahoo Calendar um, if one uses that and you can um, save and it opens your calendar and then you save it to your calendar and then you can invite the narrator from your calendar and you just click on invite other, you know, it's uh, guests when you go into Google uh, calendar, you click on guests and you can put in the email of the person and invite them. Simpler option is to copy the information that's in the um, meeting that you saved. It gives you the PM, the, the meeting ID and the password and the link. And you copy that and you paste it into an email to send your narrator. That's another way of doing it. If you don't have those calendars and you don't want to do that, you can just work with the information that you're given. So perhaps I should pause. Okay, most questions are being answered in chat. Okay. All right. Uh, question using an external mic while also recording in Zoom. We're going to talk about external recording near the end of this. Um, there are, um, there are video, um, I, there's a link to it in the end in resources. There is a free uh, broadcast platform company that um, that allows you to do high res video recording. The audio is from a feed. You sorry, you take your favorite audio device and your favorite microphone and you feed it into the software and it takes that as its audio feed. Again, the problem that we always run into is what does the narrator use? So if you want to, if you use your powers of persuasion to uh, persuade a narrator to receive a package from you and you're going to ship that package containing an expensive microphone and a recording device with a set of instructions for uh, um, someone who's never done this before to figure out how to use a recording device and set it up properly and record it successfully and then trans and then ship it back to you. Uh, I heard from someone who uses this platform. He said, no one has ever in the six years they've been using it, no one has ever taken them up on that offer to get a microphone shipped to them. So again, we're, we're working with what people have and on hand and what they're likely to use on the narrator side. That's the important side. So yes, you can go to town on your own side and your questions that are asked are going to be very high fidelity, but the actual narrator is the one that's the tricky one. If you do have a setup where it's worked, then do it. If you can get a narrator to, to use this stuff um, and there, you know, it depends. Some people might be up to the challenge and uh, they might accept it. Okay, issue about consent. Um, consent hasn't changed for us. We send we um, email them the consent form. And so far, uh, I deal with a, um, a lot of people who are, are 
professionals and working. And so the idea of signing a consent form in PDF and sending it back is not a trouble for them. But there's, you know, printing it off and signing it and scanning it and sending it back. Um, that might be really tricky. The idea of, of an on-camera consent, doing that as a procedure with, where you read out the consent and you ask them to affirm in a video I, other people could talk about that. This is Zoom recording, so I, I think that's maybe a subject for other other people who know more about that than I do. Okay, so it sounds like there's good information in the chats, and um, we'll make sure, even though it says to save the chat, I here's a best practice. You think you've set up the thing to do one thing. You set up Zoom to do one thing, um, and you don't want to find afterwards that it didn't happen. So um, I might just before this meeting ends, do a select all on the chat window and copy that and and uh, keep a, keep a backup copy because you never know. Um, so uh, hopefully scheduling a new meeting is uh, fairly clear. Let's close that out. Um, so working with your narrator, um, it's oral history center best practice to have a pre-interview that's not recorded where we talk with the narrator about expectations, about, about the process, answer any questions they might have. This is after they've received the invitation letter that we send, which is a kind of informed consent letter. Um, it does double duty with Zoom because you can set up a Zoom meeting with them and see what their setup is and hear what their setup is and give advice about how to make some changes so that it optimizes the, the, uh, the recording. So there's a whole bunch of problems that have to do with rooms that people record in and with the way that Zoom records. So um, you might want to do a little recording test uh, in the preliminary interview, um, and just dummy, don't don't talk about any information that might be confidential. Just ask them about the weather or whatever, and just get a sense of uh, afterwards of what the recording was like. Um, there are two things you need to think about with respect to recording, and that's sound and light. Uh, one of the biggest things that can affect the sound quality of a recording is the room in which it's recorded. Large rooms can be boomy. They can reflect sound and amplify sound. Uh, so if possible, get a narrator to record in a smaller room. The smaller, probably the better, not a closet, but, but something a little more comfortable. Bedrooms can be good if you can, if that's not too intimate and you can shoot on the right angle. Uh, why? Um, lots of soft surfaces. So soft plush surfaces, carpets, things like that absorb sound. They don't reflect it. If you have a mid-century modern home with 14-foot ceilings and a glass wall and hardwood floors and mod furniture made of plastic, I guarantee you that recording is going to be terrible, but it's going to look fantastic. So uh, the audio matters and you want to think like a microphone in that respect. You want to respect uh, that the microphone is going to pick up only the sound of the person's voice and nothing else. Um, another thing you can think about. So when you're thinking about a, a room, uh, you want a combination of absorptive surfaces like uh, a duvet cover or pillows, a carpet, rugs, anything like that. And also uh, reflective surfaces or diffractive surfaces, so uneven surfaces. If you have an empty rectangle room, like with with so with walls that are perfectly uh, parallel, uh, that's the sound can bounce around even in a, sm in a small room. If you go into a small room with no furniture in it, you clap your hands and it echoes like crazy. So you want uh, bookcases, all these different books of different sizes and shapes, not evenly put back in the bookcase, the sound is going to bounce all kinds of directions and the sound will get confused and dissipate and not um, accompany the original sound coming from the voice to, to confuse the audio signal and confuse the audio device. So, um, 
so you want to make sure of that. This There's a segue from talking about the room sound and noise from the room to talking about how Zoom processes audio. I don't have the proprietary algorithms for Zoom, but listening to recording results, I can fairly confidently conclude that there are algorithms that compress the sound, that um, privilege um, louder sounds as opposed to smaller sounds, and then do noise reduction on the background noise. And this is very aggressive. And the more background noise there is, the more aggressive the Zoom um, algorithms become. And it's so aggressive that the background when you're recording, the narrator's background can sound quiet. I had this experience when I did my first official Zoom recording with a, with a narrator. And he sounded terrible after we had worked on settings and, um, you know, make sure it's a quiet room. I had a whole list that I emailed to all my narrators of what to do about your room and what to do about sound and light. So I was puzzled because there was no background noise, but he sounded like a robot. He sounded digital. He, it was garbled. The ends of the words were clamped down. And, this, and there's a, a background warble whenever he would talk. And I was trying to figure out what was going on. And I asked him, so, so is there any noise in the background? It sounds really quiet. And he said, well, no, it's quiet in here. I have the window open onto a street in downtown San Francisco, though. And so that was it, right? And, and it was sirens and cars and all this in the background, but enough to make the zoom compression and, and limiting software go nuts and try to clamp down on it to give you what zoom thinks is good quality audio. And oral historians are very persnickety about sound, uh, but there's a good reason for that or multiple good reasons for that, which I won't bother going into, but let's say we wanna get good sound um, from narrator's voices because the voice is what matters to us. So uh, I haven't figured out how to turn Zoom compression off, um, but maybe I can persuade them to give us uh, um, an uncompressed audio feed uh, when recording. Um, this will come up when we talk about external audio recording. Um, so that's sound. Um, light sources. Uh, Lighting is very kind of artistic, I suppose. There are a couple of rules of thumb. People love to be interviewed right in front of a bright window with the sun coming in. And it looks like they're in a witness protection program. Uh, so yeah, counsel people about where to sit if they can. Again, you have to deal with what you deal with. They might have a fixed computer setup that they can't move easily and you have to do deal with it however way you can. So in that case, if they can't move from that position, um, I would ask them to close the drapes and use internal lighting. And so you want to light the face. I have an incandescent light bulb here to sort of light my face here. And then I've got an external monitor that's kind of bright white light coming here. And there's a window here that's, that's lighting me up. And, um, you know, think about background. I advise against using digital backgrounds unless absolutely necessary. Let's say they just don't have the luxury of having a, a nice background and or they don't, you know, they just want it um, to, to sort of cover it up some way. And they want a nice picture of the Golden Gate Bridge behind them. And that's fine. What happens with those kinds of uh, digital backgrounds is that as people move around, they can move in and out and their, like their torso can disappear if they just move a few inches. Uh, so lots of funny stuff can happen with digital backgrounds. So I, if you can avoid doing it, I, I'd rather have a white sheet up in the background, um, but there are different things you can, you can work out. Um, and uh, we've already talked about the internet connection, but that's something that needs to be broached in this interview preparation stage. Um, headphones with mic built-in microphones are 
a favorite of people using Zoom. I think they're pretty terrible, pretty much across the board. Uh, it seems like it's a good idea because you think the microphone is closest to the to the voice, and therefore it filters out other noise. But uh, it's so hard to get people to worry about the microphone itself. There, there's other clothing that rubs up against it. Um, it doesn't, and, and usually they're fairly cheap and worn out, and um, you get all kinds of hum problems. Uh, headphones are the bane of what I do. Um, and it just looks nicer to have someone just talking. And the computer microphones are getting better and better. There's usually multiple ones located across a laptop to give you a fairly good coverage. Uh, it's not an external microphone by any means. It's not a studio microphone, but it's surprisingly good. Uh, so that's something to consider when you're giving advice about what to use. They might say, look, I've got kids in the background. It's, it's, it's chaos here. I need to use headphones. Great. I mean, let's work with what we have. Um, we can't, it, uh, people are in family situations in lockdown where there's just going to be noise and we have to we have to deal with that. And, and uh, that's just part of it. So advise that not using headphones is a good idea. I have one of my colleagues got some fancy new Sony MDX uh, headphones with a built-in microphone. They're probably about a hundred bucks, but you don't want to send a narrator, go spend a hundred dollars so you can have good sound. Um, again, just working with what people have. But hers, the, the microphone does not rub against other things and the sound is very clean and clear. So, um, you know, in your other work that might be uh, appropriate. Uh, so, all right here. So security, um, we talked about meeting passwords. Of course, if a meeting ID and a password is shared widely, um, you know, that can be tricky. Um, if it's shared, you know, but if you're just setting up an interview with someone, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, people are concerned about Zoom. Uh, I don't think they should be. When the recordings are recorded to the cloud, it's encrypted. And what you want to do is have a communication plan around data management with your narrator. So you can say, look, this is not going to be out there. It's going from one server to another, it's not, it's not likely to be hacked, it's, it's encrypted. Uh, there are other more interesting on the internet, under, other more um, accessible things, let's say, on the internet to steal. Um, and so I think you can, uh, you can assure your narrators that there won't be a problem. In meeting, I think the answer is very simple and elegant. Uh, Zoom has included a lock meeting feature. It's located both under participants, your tab when you go um, set up your, um, your uh, in meeting, you can go to participants and it will have a lock meeting feature. And it's also under security and you click on security and you could lock the meeting. No one can come in even if they have the password. Simple. Uh, so that's the easiest thing to think of on your checklist of when you're now, you know, starting your meeting and you make sure to hit record and record to the cloud. If you have a license, there's a two step process with uh, recording to the cloud. Record to the cloud or if you have a free account, you just hit record. Uh, and then the next thing you want to do when the narrator is there is lock the meeting. And that just makes it uh, easier to work with. So we talked about security in terms of your personal meeting ID. Um, and I thought there might be an issue around people including information in a chat that they didn't want to be in the interview. And they might be thinking, well, that's, you know, I just don't want that to be out there and I want it to be confidential. Uh, you might want to just deselect that so it's safe or just talk to narrators about using the chat. Um, chats are saved. Uh, so that's something that you want to think about uh, when you're doing this kind of work. All right, so the actual interview. Uh, 
you have set up, you've scheduled the meeting now, and it's the time for the meeting. You enter the meeting and the narrator joins the meeting. Um, We'll talk about running separate audio. Uh, and uh, if you're doing so, the narrator is going to start the audio on their side, and you're going to start the audio on your side. Um, so lock the meeting, press record, then save to the cloud if you have the licensed version. For audio purposes and synchronizing different audio files in the future, um, you might want to ask the narrator to clap once loudly at the beginning. Uh, and that gives you a, a sync point for software that could integrate video and audio later. Um, this is only relevant if you're if you're recording with a separate device. And then you do your usual thing in oral history. You you tell you know, introduce the narrator and and talk about um, the date and location and session number. Now, uh, when you stop the recording, you might going might be thinking, where is the file with this recording? it doesn't begin to generate the file until you end the meeting. So you can't just stop recording and then go look for it. Uh, you have to end the meeting. Then you go back to your, your Zoom um, web interface. And they'll, on the left-hand side, there's a, a facet that says recordings. And you click on that and it take, give it about half an hour because it processes it into a file that can be used. If you have the licensed account, it also gives you the audio file, the separate audio file, and a separate transcript. So that takes a little while to do. So if it doesn't appear there right away, don't worry. It's going to be there. Uh, just a note on, I'm not going to talk about joining by telephone um, because I think it's a bit beyond the scope of this. We're assuming the use of Zoom. People can dial in to Zoom, and there's numbers on the uh, on the options when, when, when a meeting is scheduled. But it depends on what kind of license you have. And many institutions, if not, not most, sort of limit out of country calling or in uh, calling from another country. Um, and so th that might not be the best option if you're interviewing someone from around the world. There's other voice over internet protocols, VoIP, V-O-I-P, if you want to look that up for uh, doing calls to avoid expensive long distance and that kind of thing. And you can record uh, with some of that software, but that's a bit outside of the scope of what we're doing. And I got this recent update speaking of how quickly Zoom um, changes things up. Due to increased demand, dial in by phone, audio conferencing capabilities may be temporarily removed from your free basic account. We recommend using computer audio capabilities. So using Zoom, but just shutting off your video. Now, um, I'm just going to talk briefly about how to record on um, how to do a separate audio recording. So we're, we settled on PCM Recorder Lite which is available on iPhone uh, in your app store. It's free. So we wanted something that was free and on smartphones, phones, and the wide availability of smartphones, phones, <laughs> led me to believe that, uh, that this would be a good option for many, if not, if not most, narrators. There's an Android version. It seems to be less well supported. So in our, um, on our website, um, under resources at the Oral History Center, there is a Zoom recording protocols document that details other options for Android phones. There's three other possibilities for free apps that, um, that allow you to record high quality audio. So the difference is that it's uncompressed, it's at the site, it's not going through algorithms that will manipulate the sound at all. It's through the microphone of a phone, which is not ideal, but it's way better than I think what you're going to get on Zoom. Uh, so I'm going to just unshare for a second. Now you can see me, presumably. So I have my iPhone here, and I've got this app called PCM Recorder Lite. And I click on that, and it opens this very simple interface. It's defaulted to wave audio, which is CD quality audio, 16-bit, 44 kilohertz. 
And it's super simple. You click record and then you click stop. And then when you have, make myself bigger. How about this? Enter full screen. How's that? Am I bigger now? Okay. Um, okay. So um, it, hopefully you can see me and see this uh, device. Let's move in here. So you can click on record and it records. And then you click stop when you're done. And then you click up here with this play thing and it has the files there. And then on the right hand side, you'll see these three dots and you click on the, whoops. Oh, that's, and <laughs> so the three dots, come on now, the three dots on the far right side give you options and then you can share with various means through email or through, uh, the best thing is probably through G Drive if you have a, a Gmail account uh, or a Google Drive. Um, you may not have that and there are other uh, choices you can make with respect to that. Uh, so there are ways to share it. If you don't want to do, if the narrator does not want to do that kind of sharing, uh, you can ask them to plug it into their computer and it can be pulled through iTunes or, or Apple Music uh, and there are instructions of how to do that. So it's, it's relatively uh, simple, but it needs to be, there's some walking through that needs to be done. So that was the way that we decided the best way to capture high definition audio and share it. There are a couple of tricks or problems with it. Uh, when we did demos of it uh, and I synchronized the, we synchronized the high quality independent iPhone recording to the Zoom recording in a audio, uh, audio video editor. Um, there is micro latency in the uh, Zoom recording. So the Zoom recording is constantly delaying and catching up, even in a way that you can't even tell it's happening. So what would happen is I'd synchronize it at one point and then the audio would go out of sync over the course of a minute and then back into sync. So this is uh, a lot of uh, a, a bit of a problem when you're thinking about syncing up an entire um, an entire interview, but it may be useful for a clip, and it will certainly be useful in getting high quality audio for a, uh, for a podcast, right? So you can it's, and and the final thing is it serves as a backup which is very important. You never know what's going to go wrong with your recording setup. So having the audio as a backup is a good best practice in any case. Now this is a lot to, um, to work with for someone who's not familiar with tech and not um, adept at it, but it is a finite set of instructions that um, I've had success with so far with the people I've worked with. Now there are other populations that are going to have more of a challenge, um, but I think smartphone is the most accessible thing that people have around. It's more accessible than some old tape recorder that someone has in a garage. Uh, this is going to be uh, the thing to use if you're going to do separate audio recording. Doesn't require a microphone. It doesn't require a machine that has to be sent to them. This is going to be the best uh, the best setup for them. All right, so um, let me just back to all right, so there we go. So uh, there are full um, Zoom instructions on joining a call by phone. Um, we'll share this documentation. Um, uh, on our website, go to the Oral History Center uh, website, UC Berkeley, and under resources on the left-hand side, there will be documents. Um, this will not be there right away. Um, and uh, you'll also get um, uh, a link to this recording if you've registered. Uh, but that's going to take a few days, so it won't appear right away. 
and then we'll look into having a copy of it on our website under resources so that it's just accessible to everyone. And again, we're going to look at doing more uh, uh, more of this in the future with updates um, because this is an important issue and it's an issue that's fast moving and this is probably going to be obsolete in three months. So, <laughs> so uh, it's going to require some updating. And those resources here, uh, there are just two ends of the spectrum. Um, uh, this OBS project um, is this kind of broadcast, free broadcast interface that promises to uh, allow people to use uh, 4K video, high, high quality raw um, video. Uh, again, the problem with audio is getting capture on the narrator side, and there isn't a solution to that apart from using an outboard device. So that's unfortunate. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, there's the recording around iPhones or smartphones is the easiest thing we could come up with for a narrator to work with you to figure it out. And you'd have to do some work with them and they'd have to be willing to do it. Um, this is the nature of the big nature of the, um, the Zoom recording um, world is that it requires more investment from the narrator. It's not simply a question of them. Um, the narrator has always been invested in terms of having a conversation about what they want to talk about, that kind of human side of the structure of the interview and the, the, the encounter and building the trust around communicating personal details of their lives and, and recording it and archiving it. That's always been a, a deep investment on the part of the narrator. We're asking for this extra dimension. We're asking them to learn new things uh, and to um, adapt to an environment to help us get the highest quality. Now, someone might just say, nope, I'm not going to do that. That's also fine, right? The audio quality is okay on Zoom. It's not ideal. It's not the end of the world that they say, that's beyond me. I'm going to, I can manage signing on to this Zoom contraption, but I'm not going to do this separate audio recording. That's also fine, right? So, so this is about what can we reasonably hope to do with many people, not all people, but this is what we're hoping to do with as many people as possible. And this is the best way we know how at the current time to do it. So um, that concludes the portion of the uh, uh, endless PowerPoint. Um, so I'm going to switch um, that off. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And if you have questions, email me at uh, pburnett with two Ts at berkeley.edu. And Roger is Roger E. P. as in uh, prior at berkeley.edu and that's the best way to get in touch with us and share your problems or frustrations or joys with using zoom recording